Hello there and welcome to Midnight's Edge. My name is Tom Connors. With me is Mecca Random 42 and we're here to talk to actress Lisa Wilcox, who's been in several film and television roles over the years, but is most well known for her role as Alice in Nightmare on Elm Street 4 and 5. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started. I'm actually originally from Missouri. We moved out, my due to my father's business, moved out to California um, when I was about 14 years old. And in Missouri, I, I really was more into reading books, very bookwormish, and I was wanted to go into the medical field actually is what I wanted to do and I did have one acting experience in Missouri just before we came to California and um, it's kind of an interesting story I even though I was rather very kind of shy introverted I did love to read out loud in class like an English class I would raise my hand to read out loud the poem in English class or whatever for some reason I was fascinated with that but <laughs> So I was in ninth grade. We've moved now to a small town called Washington, Missouri, and they had play auditions for um, MASH. And you're probably all familiar with the old TV show MASH. Oh, yeah. And and actually, it, there, it's a play as well. The school was doing it, so I auditioned, and I got this little role, uh, Ms. Randazzle. So I was not hot lips. I was basically... Well, back then they said, the, you know, the secretary, but I was like the sexy secretary and the stiletto heels and the red lipstick and whatnot. So I had two scenes and basically these scenes were done on the proscenium while behind the curtain they were getting ready for the next, you know, moving, you know, sets around and stuff like that. So I had these two scenes. So we have opening night and there's like 400 people in the audience at this high school. And I, I walk out and I'm strutting in my pencil skirt and I have my little memo pad and pencil and then the scene is with this guy's playing like my boss and I'm supposed to go over and sit on the desk and cross my legs and flirt and blah 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 right so um so I'm I'm walking across and um I don't know if you're familiar with footlights but there are lights that move up and down uh to for lighting or they're down if you don't need that kind of lighting so they're supposed to be down and locked well one of them wasn't locked and this is the path I'm walking and the footlight opens and my foot goes down into the footlight with my four inch strappy heels and I'm completely trapped by this footlight center stage. Okay, so the audience doesn't know really quite what to make of this, you know, and neither do I, but all I know is I'm trapped. And so the, the guy who plays the boss, whatever, at the desk, he starts doing an improv, saying things like, you know, I had a little too much to drink there, Ms. Randazzle. You know, it was, it was quite horrifying. And so finally they realized backstage something was amiss. And mind you, pencil skirt, I'm like in this most awkward position, straddled out on the stage. My pencil and stent of flat have, caught, of course, gone flying. Anyway, I am rescued. Someone sticks their head through the curtain, helps me to just, you know, untangle myself from the footlight, get my shoe back, my sandals back on, and then proceeded to complete the scene. So that was my first experience in acting. Was that terrifying or was it fun? Was, was it exhilarating? It, it was exhilarating, actually. And that Monday at school, like, everybody knew who I was. No one knew who I was. But now everyone knew who I was. <laughs> you know, oh, my God, you're the one. You put in his randazzle in your book. Blah, blah, blah. So, um, so that was kind of cool. And I actually kind of liked the attention in a way. Well, at least to be noticed as a student. I mean, you know how horrible school is, you know, oh, yes. making friends, not making friends, you know, and we moved quite a bit. So um, it, it was kind of tough growing up that way. So that's it. And then my father, due to his job, moved out to uh, Irvine, California, and I finished high school there. And I actually started in Orange County. I was there a couple years, but um, a friend of mine said, hey, I'm going to this audition at Buddy Epson's Playhouse in Newport Beach. You want to come with me? I'm like, okay, sure. So I just go, and I'm just sitting there watching the auditions happening for this play, and my friend is auditioning for, and then this lady keeps tapping me on the shoulder, this beautiful blonde woman. Her name is Jane Nye, and she's producing this play, and she kept tapping me going, you're auditioning, right? I'm like, um, no, 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 thank you, thank you, no, 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 no. I've already had my experience with acting. I don't think so. As exhilarating as it was, I was staying on my doctor path, right? Anyway, so she asked me like three times. So I finally said, okay, I got up. I auditioned for this lead role in a play by Lanford Wilson called The Hot Al Baltimore. And I got the lead. 
and it was amazing. So with that experience, I was definitely bitten by the acting bug and I've been acting ever since. And I did equity waiver theater over, you know, play after play while going to school full time, went to UCLA and I did some main stage and I did a student film and the writer of that student film brought his manager who brought him to see me in a play there. So anyway, I got a manager and then my manager introduced me to some agents. So I had an agent. So out of college, you know, I have representation. So it's the traditional way they submit your eight by 10 and resume. Back then it was all hard copy. Didn't have used computers or anything like that at that time. And you get submitted for really like a breakdown would come out and then you're agent would submit you because you eventually were on general hospital right yeah yeah and i would if i recall i did a hard castle mccormick probably like my first my first gig i did uh, young and the restless as well mm -hmm. general hospital i had a recurring role for about okay. six eight months so we're definitely going back um had a guest role in that other than the ones you mentioned you had made a guest spot it looks like on mr belvedere and macgyver and a few other ones oh yeah and and then that, it wasn't too soon after i got nightmare on elm street to kind of set up how things were at this time. Nightmare on Elm Street 3 was a big hit. Um, and mm -hmm. at that time, it was the biggest hit for the franchise. And they went into production on Part 4 rather quickly. And at that time, there was also a writer's strike. And they didn't have a director yet when the movie first mm -hmm. started, correct? Yeah. Um, the, the... <laughs> so my manager called me and said, hey, I'm trying to get you into this movie, Nightmare on Elm Street 4. But they just, they won't see you. And I was really bummed because... When I heard Nightmare on Elm Street, I'm like, oh my gosh, because I've been a fan of horror films forever and love Nightmare on Elm Street. So I was like, oh, okay. So it's about a month later and I get a call to audition for Nightmare 4. I go in and I read the script. I loved the character. Oh my gosh, it was a dream role because of all the character arc that, you know, Alice goes through, which is what any performer yeah. would love to do. Not a one-dimensional character at all, you know? And so... I went in and I, you know, I like wore no makeup, you know, back then it was like the eighties. I mean, I was barbazoned out. Okay. I got the makeup and the, you know, I have naturally platinum blonde hair and whatever. But you went and dressed for the role. Yeah, of course. So no makeup, dirty hair, wore my worst color, which is pale yellow, by the way, especially if you don't have a tan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I went in and read. And then a couple days later, I got a call back on a Friday and I was getting married <laughs> that Sunday. So I got married on my honeymoon, and I got a call that I had booked the role of Alice Johnson. All at once. <laughs> yeah, all at once. And Annette Benson, who cast the Nightmare on Elm Street films, she told me later that what had happened with the role of Alice is they were auditioning every ingenue in town, and they couldn't find their Alice. So they went back to their reject pile, which I was in. Again, my headshot does not represent or look anything like what how you picture alice right <laughs> right so mm -hmm. anyway they went back through their rejects and i got the opportunity to audition well i think it's really amazing that you automatically recognized her her really powerful and amazing arc right did the role change at all from the original script or <clears throat> um no the script that i got i'm sure there were a number of revisions along the way while they're auditioning hundreds of actresses looking for their alice and i'm just you know Knowing, well, they wouldn't see me. What can I do, you know? So, but the script that I got no, didn't change. Um, we made some changes, you know, and yes, like you said, there was the writer's field strike happening, but there's a scene that Andres and I worked on. It's when um, I'm sitting in the TV room, basically watching old videos of Kristen and my friends. And then uh, Andres, who plays Rick, you know, my brother comes in and uh, we, we worked on that scene, the lines and stuff, which was uh, pretty cool. But no, nope, the script I got really didn't change much. Of course, my script was stolen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. oh no there goes a bunch of money well, on ebay yeah. <laughs> well you know i i telling you it was the weirdest thing um you know I had a day of shooting i get home it's late it's like 1 30 in the morning and i parked my car in, in the garage a detached garage and i'm walking up to the, my back door and i'm looking down i have my glasses on you know i'm tired i have my script bag and my purse you know whatever and i'm looking and all of a sudden i see these huge white tennis shoes that were with feet in them okay <laughs> and i look up and up and up and up and there's this huge guy standing at the corner mind you it's 1 30 in the morning and then he he goes to attack me and my it, my um instinct was to just cross my arms over my chest and it, like he's 
going to throw me on the ground. I mean, I'm screaming. This huge hand is like over my face. And but I'm like, whoa, 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 you know, whatever the, the lenses pop out of my eyeglasses. In fact, anyway, a neighbor upstairs heard the commotion, you know, and started yelling down. And the guy, thank God, ran off. Um, but in the meantime, he gra- and I had landed on my back on top of my purse. And then, and then my bag, my script bag, whatever, he managed to grab that strap, broke it off of my shoulder. My shoulder didn't break, but the strap broke. And he ran off with my script bag and my camera. Oh, no. oh no. I know. Anyway, it's all fine. Did they ever find the guy? Or? No. Oh, and here's the funny part. My husband did hear me, right? He comes running out with a butcher knife, okay? <laughs> but by this time, the guys run off. The police came. Of course, they separate the husband and wife. That's what they do to make sure it wasn't some kind of marital fight or something. Or conspiracy. Yeah, conspiracy. Yeah. <laughs> but apparently, his, this 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 robber's buddy was in the garage robbing cars, right? And I just came in at the wrong time, you know? Oh, wow. And the guy on the corner was being the lookout, right? So, anyway, there you go. So, somewhere out there, there's a floating around original Nightmare and War script with my notes on it. Wow. <laughs> I think it's probably long gone. I'm sure the guy destroyed it. I'm sure he tossed it. (laughs) I'm sure he had no idea who he was going after, too, sadly. Right. (laughs) (laughs) So what what was the shooting like? Well, you see, at the time, I'm like, I'm new at this, you know, this film thing, you know. So to me, it seemed all seemed perfectly normal, you know. It's only later I went, oh, yeah, that was kind of crazy. We're filming. Then the set next door is filming, so we would have to stop so the set could do theirs and be quiet. And then it would go back to our set and then start again, you know. So that's kind of unusual, you know, quiet on the set. It's like, well, I am on set. No, the other set. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, because they had a lot of units going at once. Yeah, there's a lot of units going on. Yeah, um, but it's but I didn't know any different, <laughs> you know. So that so that was interesting. Sure, we had some overtime days, certainly, but certainly not every day was an overtime day. I mean, typically you were working twelve hours a day. Yeah, there was you know a day here and there where it was I remember one seventeen hour day that was pretty radical. But things went smoothly. Like the location, as far as I know, you know, the location filming went fine. I love location filming, by the way. It's so much fun to film in real locations, you know. And it's like, oh, it's like a field trip. Where are we going, you know? Mm-hmm. So to me, though, I didn't feel any tension on set or anything rushed. Rachel Tale was uh, the producer who was around the most, I would say, and she was right. totally cool. I mean, she was a really cool chick. But, um, you know, when I got called and had to leave my honeymoon early, you know, we'd already pre- prepaid the hotel and we were in Hawaii, you know, all that. So she felt really bad about that. And, and she actually gave me, I think it was her own money, $300 to try to make up for, you know, wow. the expense. So that was, and, and of course, getting back early ended up being important because we did a whole test shoot, you know, and, and that's when it's like, Lisa, we want to dye your hair and you know, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, a lot of attention to detail was given, which I certainly appreciate it. I appreciate. And even for, you know, it's a horror film, but they took the time to do a whole day test shoot, the lighting and angles. And, you know, there was just a lot of detail happened to it. A lot of love, a lot of love. Oh, yeah. Now, how much was um, that to kind of separate Alice from Kristen? Did they say anything about why she was a redhead or? Yes, because because Rennie hired three blondes. Tuesday night to play Kristen <laughs> had to be blonde because, you know, to look like the Kristen from Nightmare 3, right? Mm-hmm. Then um, Brooke Thies, who played Debbie, you know, gets killed, turned yeah. into a cockroach, right? Well, she's blonde as can be, okay? And then there's me blonde as can be (laughs) so they had to make some changes so they threw on a big old 80s wig onto debbie and then uh and then they said lisa will you rinse your hair or dye it and i was like well rinse is that okay a rinse of course it didn't matter i should have dyed it because after 10 weeks of having (laughs) rinse put on your hair it stains white hair (laughs) so um what was it like working with robert england on the set Oh, he was great. He was great to us kids, you know. I mean, he's a well-seasoned actor and whatnot. I mean, it's not to say we didn't have our own training and stuff, but, you know, you know, for the most part, our first 
movie. You know what I mean? So, um, but no, he was great and he was just friendly and um, just lovely to work with. He's super, uh, quite a raconteur, has wonderful stories. I don't know if you've ever gotten to visit um, any of the conventions or the Q and A's or anything, but he just has great stories. And but he, he'll talk about anything. I remember he was like remodeling his, his bathroom or something, and and I'm into interior design. And <laughs> you know, we're talking about like grout colors that should be used on the tile in the bathroom <laughs> while he's while he's getting his Freddy makeup put on, and they're putting rinse on my hair. <laughs> you know what I mean? But how weird is that though? You're just sitting there talking about everyday, yeah. normal, mundane things yeah. with Freddy Krueger. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Yes. I mean, at first it was just so, you know, the first day of set or meeting him, you know, it was like, oh my God, it's Robert England. Oh my God, oh my God, you know, and she myself. Like meeting a beetle or something. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, exactly. Because I'm like a fan, you know. Um, but no, he, he totally puts you to ease. And, and to this day, I mean, we're all great friends. I mean, not just Robert and and I, and I mean, I, you know, I'm friends with his wife and, you know, I've been go to his house and like we're all friends and all the cast you know from nightmare four actually we're like super tight super tight i'm really good friends with amanda wiss as well you know tina um mm. just um i don't know how to explain it it's it's like in all the cast of nightmare four we're, we're just tight if they needed a kidney i would i would donate i would give one and that seems to be the case with a lot of the entire franchise. Everybody, like, it, like you guys know you're all kind of in that together, and you you know you're kind of um the the fans love your characters so much, and they would kind of do anything. They would travel thousands of miles to meet you guys, and they, yeah. you know, so yeah, <laughs> it's totally flattering. I mean, seriously, it really is, and it's it is like one big community, you know, because all the supporters are just so loyal to horror or whether it's Friday the 13th or Nightmare on Elm Street or whatever, you know, it's just such a big family yeah, on top of a family, you know? Mm -hmm. Did you know right away when you went in that you were like taking on this mantle of people like Jamie Lee did with Laurie Strode and then Heather Lankenkamp did, of course, prior to this before her character died. And Alice arguably is just as or as important as Nancy's character was early on. Did, did you know going into it that there was that? that that was kind of like a thing or was it just you didn't really think about it until after the fact not at the time no had no idea had no idea 30 years later that it the franchise would just grow and the the following of these films and now the 80s you know are so hot right now 80s 90s and right um but no i had no idea no no one thing that was always unique about the Nightmare on Elm Street films is that the horror element always seemed to take a back seat to the fantasy, especially when it came to part four and they introduced the whole Alice in Wonderland element, which went along with your character. And the movie really connected with fans, making about $50 million at the box office, which was unheard of at the time for a horror film. How did the success affect you? <laughs> well, I, you know, it was... <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. I mean, the critics went crazy. I mean, in a good way. I mean, they just went crazy for it. Yeah, they it loved did get really it. good reviews. Yeah. Great reviews. And it was number one for like weeks. Unheard of for a horror film. And like you said, it has these fantasy elements to it. And it appealed to a whole kind of different audience. It could almost be like a date movie, you know? I mean, look, you've got Freddy Krueger putting on Ray-Bans at the beach, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and there's not a lot of blood and guts, you know? It's really more about the lore, and it's about, you know, how he comes up, how he's going to kill you. He takes advantage of your worst fear, okay? Right. And yeah. we could relate to that in a way. It's like, oh, my God, I hate bugs. Oh, my gosh. Or... You know, whatever it is, it's just, it has, it's an intelligent film. I think in general, the Nightmare on Elm Street series is intelligent, you know? It's just not a slasher movie, you know? It's um, smart, and and I think people really grabbed onto it that summer. Someone was telling me, like, it was number one over, I want to say, like, Young Guns and some other, like, big movies. So, yeah, we were all blown away by the acceptance of, and, it, you know, maybe it kind of launched horror into a whole kind of new level and that will we'll bring us into part five 
when were you told about it? Were you involved in that process at all? Or was it just kind of like, we're doing part five? Are you involved or what? <laughs> you, know, you, you know what? It really was that. We're doing part five. You want to do it or not? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I had no nothing to do with the storyline or a- anything at all. And then uh, met with the director, Stephen Hopkins. And, you know, right. we had a lunch and this and that. And, and then that was kind of it. What was your reaction to the script when you first read it? Well, I liked things like, you know, dad has re- is now a recovered alcoholic. And I-, I thought it was a very brave script because it dealt with so many touchy subject matters like teen pregnancy, abortion, okay. adoption, bulimia, anorexia. I mean, it was a very brave, and you know, think this is now 19, it came out in 1989, and you know, today, 30 years later, we we talk about these subjects and stuff, but then it was much a touchier time, you know? It was also a more gruesome film, too, uh, Dan's motorcycle death. I mean, that was crazy explicit, you know? And they had to edit parts out because it was getting like an X rating, you know? Oh. Violence. So... Anyway, to me, um, it just was perhaps a misunderstood film at the time. And it's interesting as time has gone on. And, and you know, I'm out there meeting everybody and doing the conventions and stuff. And uh, pe- a lot of folks are now going like, you know what? Nightmare 5 is my favorite one. I think it was just a little before its time when it came out in 89. And, you know, it, the tide is changing as far as its appreci- the appreciation of it. Well, I think even at the time, um, it, it's a really important epilogue to Alice's character because you could really easily end the series right there with and, and kind of skipping over part two a little bit. I mean, you could have one, three, four, and five as the lore of the franchise. Mm. And I, I think it's really important to kind of see where where Alice goes with that. And, and like you said, it dealt with all of the heavy issues. And despite the fact that it didn't have the highest body count, it definitely had a lot of more the more creative deaths and a lot of the more... Um, Gruesome. Yeah, gr- gruesome. And- well, it's definitely the darkest of the series. That's yeah. Sure. Yes. And that's what I mean, too. It was pretty brave to go there. <laughs> Going from Nightmare 4, which, you know, mm-hmm. is got the 80s music and, you know, I mean, it's a hip, cool film. You know, Robert likes to call it the MTV uh, no uh, version of the, <laughs> of the series, you know, and then 5, it's like, whoa, whole turnaround, you know. Very gothic, and, dark horror. Yeah. yeah, which in its own right is super cool i love the comic book stuff in the movie in the movie in nightmare five i think that's so brilliant alice is kind of more the lead in mm-hmm. that movie as opposed to freddie because freddie is a little bit more in the background until mm-hmm. you know, and it is more alice's story then because mm-hmm. part four alice's character doesn't really bloom in the story until about a third or so into the film because mm-hmm. you have to tie up all the loose ends of part three so then what was it like now basically having this entire movie revolved around your character you're basically the star now and uh, then there, I, there was a little more pressure because now uh, here I do this nightmare for I'm just focused on it. And now the huge success and now they want me to be the lead in the number five. So, yeah, some pressure's on, but it's it's, um, you know, it was a different feeling, definitely. But I love that Alice is like taking on Dan's parents and going, damn it, no, it's my child. You know, it's like, we see well, she's Alice. She's allowed to grow, yes. Yeah, she and has grown Change as a character. Yeah, yeah. And she's, she's grown up, even as a teenager. And to have the father supporting his daughter, I just love that. You know, he's like, keep the baby, you know? I mean, it's like kind of a soap opera in a way too i mean parts of it in a good way you could almost take freddie out of the movie and you would have this touching teen pregnancy story with the father and daughter relationship you you have the friends going through bulimia you have the the loss of the partner of the boyfriend character you know yeah. you, you could make this movie without having the horror element yeah and it I doesn't think have to one. have freddie in it. yeah yeah <laughs> and maybe that's what it didn't do so well they wanted more freddie because actually nightmare five has is the least screen time of all the films of Robert England, of Freddy. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna say because I think we go from four where it's the most to mm. <laughs> at that point anyway to the least I think in five. I think you're right about that. Yeah. So was that a smart move? I don't know. <laughs> Does the box office tell us that? I don't know. But I still think it's a good story. So. Yeah, it, it didn't do nearly as well as the last few films in the box office, but there was a lot of competition to be fair in that time 
Um, that was a summer where not only you had Batman, Indiana Jones, uh, mm. Ghostbusters. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty rough competition. Yeah, no question yeah all about at once. It. Plus another Friday the Thirteenth movie to go up against as well, and, and he's in Manhattan at that time. Yeah, so. party. Right. Oh. When Freddy's Dead came about, though, was there any interaction with you? Did they ask if you wanted to come back for another one, or was it just they were doing their own thing and they never even bothered to contact you at all? Uh, well, it's funny they did contact me, but simply it was for because they used some scenes or right. bits of from four. So they needed my permission or whatever, you know, so, okay. And then I said to my agent, I said, I, I don't understand. Why don't they just have me in it? I mean, what what's going on? Find out. I would love to do it. Right. And, and it was filmed in Canada, interesting enough. And it was on such a low budget. They said, literally, I said, you know, even a cameo or something. And they said, well, if you want to fly yourself up here. <laughs> We could fit in a cameo. I'm like, wow. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay. Wow. No, I'm not going to be doing that. <laughs> they, and oh, thank you so much. Gee, you know. Did it really hurt that they didn't really continue? Oh, well, yeah. It, it totally did. Totally. I was like, man, <sighs> whatever. No comment. <laughs> Yeah, um, so what was it like um, being on Star Trek The Next Generation for a guest spot? Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. It was great. Oh, my land. I wanted that part so bad. Well, I mean, again, it's typical your agent, manager, you know, submit your 8x10, your resume. You hope you get the audition. You don't even know what they're submitting you on. All you do is you get a call from your agent saying you have an audition tomorrow at 1120 a.m. at Paramount, and it's for Star Trek, and... You know, you can come pick up the script and the sides, and these are the scenes you're doing. You work on it that night, and you go and do your thing, right? Because it was a pretty successful TV show, right? There was a lot of girls in that hallway. Oh, my gosh, so many. And I um, I don't know. You know, you just have to just stay calm and focused on the choices you I've made for the character, Utah, and just did my take on it, and book the role the heart one of the hardest parts about auditioning because it's not like oh because nightmare on elm street 4 was you know such a huge success oh no you have to continue to prove yourself you don't get offered things i had a couple cool opportunities with some bigger films didn't book the role i just wasn't quite right for the part you know but you always have to continue to you know prove yourself again but yeah i went in there and i remember i wore this black skin tight i don't even know why i chose so, well i was thinking star trek I thought of their outfits, those skin tight uniforms they wore, you know? Yeah. So I wore a black one and then I wore like this big round circle belt thing, right? And I don't know why I chose that, but I did. And <laughs> whatever, I got the part, you know? And it was really, it was, it was filmed at Paramount, which is one of the most beautiful studios in Los Angeles, if not the world. And yeah, I mean, just the history there. So it's always magical to work on a studio lot like that and they these sound stages they built for star trek i am telling you guys they are amazing they build a planet inside these huge warehouses down to the detail it's just fascinating absolutely fascinating so were you a fan before you did the show though or oh yes <laughs> yes no yes i was a fan I, i've always loved horror and sci-fi and i know some people kind of choose one or the other, but I, I've always loved both. So, oh, and to work with here. Patrick. <laughs> yeah. um, right on, right on. And so cool, a number of years later, they did Monopoly boards um, specific to certain TV shows, and they did a Star Trek Next Generation one. And <laughs> I only found out about this because I think it's a fan or someone told me, they're like, you know, you're on the Star Trek Next Generation Monopoly board. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, I actually had that for a while. Did you? That, that was awesome. oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I wish my I still gosh. did. Yeah, so, you know, it's not that they sent me one, so I went and bought one, and I'm like, oh, my God, and me and the kids would play Monopoly on it and go, oh, look, I landed on Mom, because I'm actually a property. 
on the on the board <laughs> and 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 then the little booklet it comes with it talks all about the characters on the board and i'm one of them and it talks about utah and the trelestas and you know all the whole story so that was a huge compliment because i started going okay there's got to have been hundreds of guest stars on that show so i was like this is pretty cool so anyway and then so they I- did do some trading cards and stuff too yeah <laughs> All right, well, we know we're running low on time, but one thing I had questions about, because I'm a big Bill and Ted fan, and now you know where this is going. (laughs) Yes. How did that crazy live-action series come together? Well, you know, and it's funny, because I have it on my banner, Bill and Ted's, and they're like, you were in Bill and Ted's, and I'm like, the TV show, it was the TV show, we were on for a year, but it it was, seriously, I I auditioned, you know, again, just go to the lot, I think it was Lorimar, I went to audition for that, and I, I remember I auditioned and I got a call back, which, you know, great. And that's typical. And I was so sick. I had gotten like super sick and I went on my call back and I was terrible. So I called my agent and I said, can you please, please, please call them and let me come back and do it again. And the callback wasn't the final callback with all the producers. It was with Geraldine Leader, who is the casting director for that particular show Geraldine leader cast a hundred million things and I was on her a list you know she brought me in for all of her projects so thank God she let me go back in and do my callback and then I was right on point you know and then I got the final callback where you meet with all the network and the producers and the writers and the director and all that and I booked the role <laughs> so and at that point I had just had my first son he was about oh, four months old wow. okay and um and we filmed that in vancouver so i went to got to live in vancouver for a few months with you know my husband and my my little boy uh and it it was so much fun to play missy are you kidding oh god i love it yeah uh you took some time off to raise your family and then you decided to come back to acting which you have like a couple of projects that are coming out is there anything you want to say about any of those right now or well you know once my kids were in school it was like i really wanted to be home you know, when Alex was four months old, no problem. We can fly up, live in Vancouver for a while or whatever. But once they were in school, I really wanted to be room mom. And I, I wanted to be part of that experience. And then started a business with Tuesday night called Tope Rights and did that for like eight years. That was an amazing experience, an amazing ride. I don't know. I got into corporate world and I did that for five years, but then I got too corporate. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, in the meantime, I could still do conventions and right. take time off and, you know, but I, I mean, I think five years I never had a vacation because I was working and then would go off and do a convention, which was fun. But, you know, it's still traveling and a lot of energy investment and stuff. But then I just kind of went, you know what? I want to go back into acting full time. Dang it. <laughs> I'm just going to do it, which is kind of crazy to think to do when you're in your late 40s and you're like, oh, I'm going to just go back into acting again. But. I've been doing it, and that means everything. Commercials, print modeling, films, you know, all of it. So, knock on wood, I'm, I'm hanging in there. So Now, you did a little series. It's Was it a web series, or was it for the Chiller Network, or what was it with Robert England and a few other horror greats? Yes, Fear Clinic. Fear Clinic, yes. Uh, tell us a little yeah. bit about that real quick. Well, Kane Hodder, Daniel Harris, Robert England, myself, we did this... Uh, this uh web series yeah and oh my gosh we we did it for like nothing because we really believe in this project you know but somehow and i can't recall it come it may it was chiller but then they got bought up or whatever we feel like it just kind of fell through the cracks and it still comes up people that did get to see it and stuff and it was just such a cool idea Robert Hall directed it, um, really good director, who also is an amazing special effects guy. So, yeah, that was that was really disappointing because we were like, for sure, this is going to take off. And then they did do a movie, and then Robert literally said, he went on set, and he's like, where's Lisa? Like, where's Lisa? Like, I, they, I don't know. They didn't hire me to be in the movie. They made the role younger. Well, which we hear about that all the time in Hollywood. Yeah. Us older actresses have a harder time. That's really a bummer. And and then I guess one last story I want to share is during Nightmare on Elm Street 4, um, I've always been a re- big reader, as I told you. So how, how, how Harold Berger suggested this book called Watchers by Dean Koontz to read. So, you know, in between, you know, takes, you're in your trailer, you know, you're 
reading or whatever, making jewelry, whatever you're doing to, you know, pass the time. And so we suggest, so I was reading this book, Watchers, on the set of Nightmare 4. So years later, I get to audition for Watchers 4, the fourth version of Watchers yeah. with Mark Hamill. Okay. Well, that's right. He was and right. Wow. Yes, yes. And um, anyway, and I, I got that role and I got to work with Mark Hamill. Are you kidding? Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh. It was amazing. <laughs> so, and we had, um, he was so lovely and gracious. Uh, he loves The Simpsons. And um, so in the trailer, we would watch, he would bring Simpsons episodes, you know, from his library. <laughs> We'd watch him in the trailer. And, and then he was lovely with my kids and my husband and actually had us over to his house and swam in the pool and hung out on the on the patio. And and uh, there was a big bowl of cherries there. And my two boys, you know, were all there. And my youngest son, he was about, oh, three years old then. And he's eating these cherries. And then I look over and it looks like about a third of this big bowl of cherries is about gone. And so my youngest starts to turn a little green and he proceeds to vomit all over Mark Hamill's patty table. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. And so, and Mark, he and his wife had three kids and whatever. So he's like, oh, no problem. You know, he just, the hose is right there and he just sprays it off. Oh, jeez. You know? <laughs> so I, I'm just saying, you know, anyway, Mark, just totally down to earth family guy. Yeah. I love him. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, you guys. And please, um, you know, share. People keep going to lisawilcox.com, which makes sense for my website. But that is a very old website that somebody created, and I've not been able to get it off, you know. The the proper website is lisaewilcox.com, lisaewilcox.com. And there you can see where I'm going to be doing my next conventions or appearances or you know stuff going on all right well, we'll have so. that link in the description of course cool i have a youtube series too you find it through lisa wilcox actress um where i revisited um locations that we filmed at in cool. nightmare four well we'll link that as well yeah totally. we want to thank all the listeners out there for joining us and of course we want to thank you for joining us as well lisa thank you